Teach us to pray. In the first message of our series, we learned that Jesus' disciples had finally gotten up enough nerve to ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And like most of us, they've been praying their entire lives. But after watching Jesus pray, it dawned on them that maybe they were missing something. And now just to clarify here, we're not talking about the kind of prayer that you would say like, when you get a prayer chain call over the phone and you, you want to immediately lift that person in prayer or you know your neighbor or your friend is in illness or fell or something like that. We're not talking about that kind of a prayer. We're talking about a more relational prayer, a more intimate prayer with God. And so as the disciples were watching Jesus pray, they noticed that there was something different. And so Jesus begins by telling us how not to pray. He says, don't pray to impress other people because God's not impressed with that. And he says, don't just keep repeating the same thing over and over as if your volume of words would somehow move God into action. See, we don't need to go on and on about what we need or want or wish because Jesus said our Heavenly Father knows what we need before we even ask. Which we said last week or a couple weeks ago that if God already knows what we need, then why pray, right? I mean, and now Jesus has us right where he wants us. He has us asking the right question. Why do we pray? And his disciples wanted to know how to pray, but Jesus wanted them to understand why we pray. And isn't it true that for the most part, if you think about your prayer life, we've reduced prayer to basically informing God of our needs and our wants and our wishes or the needs and wants and wishes of those we love. That's why we pray. I mean, that's how we were taught to pray. But maybe, maybe we've been doing it a little bit wrong. And maybe we've been praying for some of the wrong reasons. And Jesus gets very, very specific. He says, but when you pray, go into your room and close the door. In other words, he's saying, find a place to isolate yourself. Now, when he said this to his first century followers, that might have been a little bit more difficult because their houses were small. And if they had doors, they were probably made out of leather. But we have bedrooms and closets and wooden doors 
And we don't find it difficult to pray an intimate prayer with our Heavenly Father because we don't have room. We find it difficult to pray because we're so busy and we're so distracted. Isn't that right? And then Jesus says this. He says, I want you to pray to your Heavenly Father, your Father in Heaven. We're to begin our prayers, Heavenly Father. And the last time we talked, we briefly discussed trying to view God as a Father, and that's something that some people struggle with, and that's a legitimate tension. And if that's a tension you're struggling with, just know that you're not alone, and God asks you to bring that tension with you. In fact, Peter, who knew Jesus intimately, said this, we can cast our cares on him because he cares for us. And then Jesus got down to business. And he gave us some of these specifics and he told us exactly how to pray. He said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And that is we are to pause and recognize who it is we're addressing when we're spending time in the presence of God. This great God who has no equal, no rival, the uncreated creator who is both infinite and intimate. And we pause to reflect on who God is. And what happens when we do that is we gain a better understanding of who we are and why we're here and what's going on around us. That's the part of prayer where we regain our bearings and we remember the context of our lives. See, if we rush by that, we'll resist what Jesus said is next that follows. And what follows is why we pray. What follows is the purpose of us spending time in prayer. And here it is, Jesus says, you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Your will be done, God, right here, right now in my life with my relationships and my resources and my plans and my schedule. Your will be done. So the purpose of prayer is to align our wills with God's will. The purpose of prayer is to surrender our wills, not to impose it. And this becomes more evident in what follows. So in part one, I challenged you at the end of the the message to begin your prayers this way. Begin by addressing your Heavenly Father and declaring His greatness and surrendering your will. Declare His greatness, hallowed be your name, and surrender your will. And this is extremely important because if there's something in you that fears or hesitates to pray, your will be done, we need to pay attention to that. <clears throat> Honestly, there's no point in continuing in Jesus' lesson on how to pray unless we prioritize His will over our own. His kingdom over our kingdom. And the reason I say that is that everything that follows that Jesus says assumes that we have surrendered. Jesus is doing more than simply teaching us how to pray properly. He's actually inviting us into an experience in a world, in a way that we'll never experience until we surrender. And then Jesus makes a pivot. He pivots to the place where we generally begin our prayers. He says, now pray this. When you pray, pray and give us today. To which we finally say, hey, finally, it's our turn, you know? I mean, but Jesus isn't taking prayer requests here. He's actually requesting that we pray three things. Three things in particular that, no surprise, assume that we have surrendered. Remember, he started there. And to help us remember these three things that Jesus asked us to pray, I put them all in the letter P. Provision, pardon, and protection. Those are the three things that we're to remember when we're praying. In the provision part of the prayer, it's the one that we're most familiar with. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 11, and when you pray, say, give us today our daily bread. I mean, that's not something that most of us are really too worried about too much. In fact, many of us eat more than our fair share of daily bread, right? But when the first century audience heard Jesus say this, that this is what they were to pray, what they must have thought of immediately was their ancestors, hundreds of years before, crawling out of their tents every single morning in the middle of the desert, collecting enough bread for the day, when they ran out and collected their manna. 
And during that season of life in the nation of Israel, God was teaching this nation, this people of Israel, to recognize their dependence on him. And he warned them. He said, look, you know, a day will come when you will have more than your daily bread. In fact, you're going to have so much bread, but don't be deceived. Even when you have plenty, you're no less dependent on me then than you are this very day when you're crawling out of your tent and collecting the bread. And the same is true for us. Because this is the part of our prayer when we need to remind ourselves that God is our ultimate provider. Not just for what we eat, but for everything. In fact, when you think about it, many of the things that we depend on most, many of these things we have little or no control over. In fact, some of us have faced seasons in life, and you may be in one right now where you're reminded on just how dependent you are on God. And if that day has not come for you yet, I assure you it will. Whether it's for food or your health or your income or possibly the physical or mental health of someone you love, suddenly you'll be reminded on just how dependent you are of your Heavenly Father. How little control you have over the things that are most valuable or the things that are most important to you. And Jesus says when we pray, we're to pause and we're to declare our dependence on him for everything, every single day. At least we forget. And this is a pretty big deal in our culture where we get in trouble because of our excess rather than our poverty. I mean, in a culture of excess, which is what we live in, we just take things for granted, right? I mean, we expect things. We feel entitled to things. And consequently, then, we become ungrateful for things. So as we're learning to pray through this Lord's Prayer, and kind of reasoning out some of the insights, I'd like to share with you an additional prayer from the book of Proverbs. A prayer that you can use to supplement this portion of the Lord's Prayer as to just not rush by it too quickly. And it comes in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8. I love this prayer. The writer says, Lord, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. In other words, Heavenly Father, don't give me so little that I'm tempted to sin or steal or cheat, but also don't give me so much more than I can handle. Now, that's really not a very American or Western prayer, is it? I mean, you've heard the preachers out there, name it and claim it and it's yours, you know, but that, that's just not what God's saying here. And then the psalmist continue, or the proverb writer continues, and he explains why it's such an important prayer in verse 9. He says, otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I might become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. I love this prayer because it slows us down and it reminds us of our dependence on God for everything that comes our way. And it reminds us of this tendency that we have to allow the things that God blesses us with to lead us astray. And you know that's possible, right? I mean, you've probably certainly met someone or you've heard about someone who became so successful that they no longer needed their faith. They no longer needed God. They were too busy for church because they had too many other options. They no longer needed to trust God because, well, they were able to just take care of themselves. We all have the potential that. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Don't allow me to be deceived into thinking that I don't need you, Lord, every single day. That I don't need you for everything. And once again, we find ourselves back to that place of surrender. So that's the provision part of the prayer. Give us each day our daily bread. And then the pardon part of the prayer that Jesus teaches us comes in verse 12. And he says, forgive us our debts. Now we all know that we're to ask God to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us our debts. But perhaps we really don't grasp or pray the second half that Jesus uses in that, as we also have forgiven our debtors. It's kind of a prayer request with a catch. 
God, forgive me, and here's what Jesus is teaching. Heavenly Father, forgive me in the same way and to the same degree that I've forgiven the people that have wronged me. Once again, the assumption is surrender. And God is saying, you need forgiveness from me, which we all know that. But God's saying, I need forgiveness from you for others. So what does that mean? It means if we're asking something for God that we're unwilling to extend to others, as Jesus' followers, we're required to do unto others as God through Christ has done unto us. We forgive because we've been forgiven. The Apostle Paul comes along later and he reverses the order of things. And here's what he writes in Ephesians 4.32. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Why? You don't even know my story. I mean, you don't know what they said about me. I mean, you don't know what they did to me. But he says, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Paul was saying what Jesus is saying. We don't forgive other people because they deserve to be forgiven. We forgive because we've been forgiven. And Jesus says when you pray, you forgive other people just as you have been forgiven. When you pray, ask for forgiveness as a reminder to forgive others. Declare your need for forgiveness, but before you do, before you move on, do a quick 360 in your mind and ask the question, Am I withholding from someone the very thing I expect God to grant to me? Forgiveness? Because to ask God to forgive you while you refuse to forgive your brother-in-law or your ex-wife or your husband or your manager or your neighbor, to ask God to do for you what you're unwilling to do for someone else reduces God to a cleansing product. It reduces God to a conscience cleaner. And prayer is not a conscious cleanse. The reason we confess our sin is to restore and maintain fellowship with God, our Heavenly Father. And the reason we forgive others is to release them from a debt that they may never be able to pay. pray. Hey, see, when you forgive, you're doing for them what God the Father has done for us. Amen? And Philip Yancey wrote, God announces forgiveness ahead of time. And we're to do the same. To refuse to forgive while asking to be forgiven. You know what that makes us? It makes us one of those folks that Jesus talked about in the beginning of this lesson. It makes us a hypocrite. The invitation to forgive, this is part of a posture of surrender. And we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus connects our forgiveness to God by forgiving others. He says, by this all people will know that you're you're my disciples if we ask for forgiveness no by this all people will know that you're followers of Christ if you love one another and we love one another by forgiveness we love one another as serving them we love one another by giving we love one another by putting others first and to refuse to forgive is to refuse to follow and suddenly we're just not maybe too sure we want to learn how to pray right because sometimes it requires too much. Sometimes it requires letting go of our well-rehearsed stories that justify our anger or our prejudice or our resentment towards someone. But Jesus wants to introduce us to a world that we'll never know or never experience until we forgive. Because surrendering to Jesus in this way, do you know what it does? It protects us from allowing those who've hurt us from becoming our Lord. Surrendering to Jesus in this way, it ensures that we don't surrender to bitterness or resentment or anger or revenge. Because those are not good masters. Those are not good lords and they don't deserve our loyalty. And this was a really, really big deal to Jesus. And to underscore how important it was to him that we forgive, this is how he ends his lesson on prayer. And I'll just tell you up front that this can create some tension for you. And since Jesus doesn't resolve the tension, I'm not going to resolve it either. Because here's what he says in verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. So far, so good, right? But then he says, 
But if you do not forgive others of their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, wait a minute. Nobody ever told me that one before. I mean, that's not, that's not what they're teaching in Sunday school, right? But a quick, quick question for you. What do you call someone who expects other people to do something for them that you're not willing to do for themselves? We covered that already. Hypocrites. I wish I could know the sign here. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Jesus' point Don't be a hypocrite You expect to be forgiven Come on now, forgive Not only does he know what you need Before you ask But he also knows what's in your heart And the scripture says Blessed are the pure in heart Because according to Jesus They will see God Blessed are the pure in heart because they will recognize what God is up to. They will be more attuned to what God is up to in the world and what God wants us to participate in. So before we go any further, before you can go any further in your prayers, ask yourself, is there anyone I need to forgive? And, and I know if I were to hear your story, you'd probably have every reason to be angry not to forgive. I get that. I've been there. And in fact, if I heard your story, I might be tempted to give you a pass. But you know what? Jesus wouldn't. Jesus wouldn't because he knows what a lack of forgiveness does to the human heart. And so because he loves you, because we have a perfect heavenly father, he coaxes you and he coaches you and he invites us to forgive. So ask yourself, is there anyone you've refused to forgive? If so, would you be willing to do that right now? Would you be willing to decide to cancel your debt as you would expect your Heavenly Father to cancel yours? Would you be willing to decide that they just don't owe you anymore? Because if we're not willing to decide to do that, and if Jesus is correct, which I believe he is, that's as far as our prayer will take us. Because we should get stuck right there every morning and every evening until we forgive. We can't move on. We can't attempt to go around that. We need to stay right there until we've surrendered this anger or hurt or resentment until we say yes and forgive. And when we do, we'll be introduced to a world, to a peace, to a freedom. We'll be introduced to a world that we'll never know otherwise. So back to the question that we asked a couple weeks ago, does prayer work? Well, praying the way Jesus prays works. It works on us. It works in us. It works to free us. But at times, yeah, it may be a bit uncomfortable. And sometimes we just might feel accountable. And let's face it, we don't like feeling accountable. And especially feeling accountable to God. We want God to be accountable to us. I, I don't like thy will be done. I want my will be, be done. And in other words, if I allow myself, or, or should I say, when I allow myself to get stuck in my prayers of God that I can't let things go, God, I'm not sure that I can cancel that debt. In that moment, I'm reminded that I focus more of my attention on what that person's done to me and where they stand with me than where I stand with my Heavenly Father. And when I'm willing to focus on the work that God has yet to do in me, I find it easier to forgive others for the work that He's yet to do in them. Does that make sense? Jesus was, I mean, He was more direct because here's how He said it. He said, first, He said, first, before you go any further, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll be able to see clearly. So do you want to see clearly? Embrace the way that Jesus prayed, and we can see clearly. To what end? So that we can fear, feel superior to those who don't see clearly? No, when I see as I truly am, I'm in a better position to love others. In spite of their differences. In spite of what they may have done. I won't judge, I'll just serve. I'll pray more like the tax collector in our first message. And the religious leader, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the prayer. 
And that's the posture that Jesus commended. This is where the prayer that Jesus prays takes us and it leaves us surrendered, dependent, and forgiven. So my challenge is find a place. I want you to find a place and choose a time that you can get alone. And I recommend that you choose the same place and the same time and you make it a priority to begin your day this way. Pray your way to surrender. And pray like this. This then is how you should pray. My Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. To the great God who is infinite because you have allowed me to call you Father. Your intimate. But your kingdom come. Your agenda is the priority. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right here, right now, in my world. This then is how you should pray. Declare your dependence on God for your provision, least you forget. God, give us this day. Give me this day my daily bread. Even though I may have more bread than I need and more bread than I should eat, I'm not going to forget that every single morsel of food, every beat in my heart is a gift from you. Give me neither riches nor poverty, but only give me what you know I can handle. Otherwise, I might have too much. I might say, who is the Lord? This then is how you should pray. Declare your dependence on God for your pardon, for your forgiveness of sin, and forgive us our debts. Forgive me of my debts as I have forgiven those. <coughs> Provision and pardon. And then the third part of our prayer is protection. Protection from what? Protection from temptation and the evil one. And here's what Jesus says we're to pray and lead us not into temptation. And because we are more than capable of finding that all by ourselves. Of course, Jesus didn't say that. He said, lead us not. And since temptation is such a big topic, we're going to save that for next week. So don't miss next week. Not because maybe temptation is such a big issue for you, but I, I know maybe you'll pick up something that you can apply to your lives or maybe share with someone else that might be struggling. I wish I found some better sounds no one's ever heard. I wish I had a better voice that sang some better words. I wish I found some chords in an order that is new. I wish I didn't have to rhyme every time I sang. I was told when I get older all my fears would shrink, but now I'm insecure and I care what people think.